Hi, I'm John Day. I'm uh, here from uh, Fred Hutch in Seattle, Washington. And uh, I'm the author of uh, Easy Update, which uh, it wasn't on the survey. Can I just get like do my own survey right now? Like how many how many people use Easy Update or have heard of it? Oh, okay. A few users out there. <coughs> um, I just threw this in real quick. So the Fred Hutch, we're uh, Seattle, Washington, we're home of three Nobel laureates. Uh, we have a pretty nice campus, um, pretty good budget. We're federally funded, uh, and uh, we have over, well, very close to 300 faculty at this point, which we refer to as PI, personal investigators, people who have funding to do research, and that's our, our campus. So R and the Fred Hutch. So the Fred Hutch has had a really interesting relationship for R. Uh, the, the main maintainers used to be on campus for eight years. Uh, they were there a long time. There's a lot of uh, leftover R users there. Uh, the main bioconductor people were there up until about a year and a half ago, and they uh, somebody's wife got a different job, and they ended up moving to a different part of the country. So we have hundreds of R users, and uh, they're very demanding people. And when R comes out, they want a new one, like within days. So uh, I'm very highly motivated to do that. So when your local R build has 800 modules, and you have to go through that list by hand and update them all for the next version of R to be released, I, I just think it's a, a, a level of work that's no longer uh, that can be performed by human. It's just, uh, it's not possible anymore. So uh, <laughs> it's just a, a real, real difficult task. And of course, Python is in a similar. So uh, the motivation, of course, so R is coming out four times a year. Python comes out a couple times a year. There's Python 2, Python 3. And again, these things have hundreds of modules, and it's just really hard to go through and update the versions for all of those. It's also very hard to unwind all the dependencies and make sure you have them and they're ordered correctly in the easy build file. So R is pretty straightforward. It has a really nice API. The metadata is always correct. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, whenever I'm updating R, it works really, really well. Um, Bioconductor is a little different. Uh, their metadata is JSON files that you download. Uh, so when I'm running easy update, there's a slight penalty to pull those files down, but we do it once, we load them. And if I see them locally installed, uh, I'll just uh, open them again. And again, the, bi the Bioconductor metadata is beautiful. It's, it's always exactly right. The dependencies have already researched. Uh, it's very well maintained, and they only update that file on new releases of Bioconductor. Python, on the other hand, it's, it's, just, a, it's just a swamp. Uh, anyone can upload a Python module. And uh, the, the type of things I see in Python are like the project name is different from the module name, which is different from the download name. The dependency names that people use, it's like street slang. It doesn't actually match the project name. So they might be referring to the import name. They might be referring to the project name. So I've just had to write a lot of extra logic to kind of tease that apart, try variations, dashes, underscores. One's allowed in URLs. One's allowed in the language. It's something to think about the next time you design a language, Guido. It's, you know, should you make language constructs match uh, across, you know, different uh, domains. Uh, Perl, uh, I had to do BioPerl uh, around Christmas. Uh, so it's not in the code. I haven't pushed it yet, and it's really ugly. Uh, I've been looking for an API for Perl, and I put that out. I joined the Perl developers mailing list and sent that out there, and they, they just treat me like I'm a crazy person. Why would you want an API? Why would you use the internet for Perl? It's in Perl, so the only way to really get the metadata you want is to do the latest install of Perl and then use Perl tools to interrogate it. 
Uh, I found there's some people out there who have taken the CPAN database and have put it all in Elasticsearch and it's searchable, but it's not so much like an API as like a curiosity. Um, it's Elasticsearch, I'm a huge fan, it's a great product. Uh, you can certainly get data out of it a lot of different ways, but like the idea of like the latest version or something like that, there's no real nice way to do that. So uh, the next time I'm under a lot of pressure to, to update Perl, I'll probably do a better job and I'll, uh, I'll get that code out there. So I'm supporting uh, th three and a half languages right now. And then the dependencies, uh, again, the R is really great. Uh, Everything that's in R, if they list the dependency, it's actually needed. No one ever leaves stuff out. Uh, and Python, people forget things. Again, it's uh, pypy.org. It's just humans typing. You know, there doesn't seem to be any gateway there that really enforces this, or they don't put it in the Jenkins con container. They don't try to make sure it actually will work or do what you say it does. So um, it's. I don't, I don't want to come here just to whine about Python, but uh, if you run easy build and there's some mistakes, you know, I, it's, you, you get what you pay for, you know. The, the PyPy maintainers are very aware of this, and they, they basically say, yeah, we can fix it. They can't. They, <laughs> and there's a blog post somewhere that explains this situation, Yeah. and they basically say, yeah, we're, we're getting whatever people put in, and yeah. we can fix it. I can say it's gotten. I don't think that's true, but yeah, I can say it's gotten a lot better uh, from a year and a half ago, and then this spring, the they really shut down pypy.python.org. Uh, you get, you don't get a 404, but it, it's they're not serving it up anymore. So through that whole process, and people are cleaning it up. It does look a lot better now than it did even two years ago. So uh, someone's paying attention and working on that. So uh, this came over the mailing list just just last week. So I thought I would throw it into the slide deck. But um, somebody wanted to, you know, what would happen if you included R stand in uh, in R? And uh, a feature of Easy Update is you can run it on the command line as long as you give it the R version. And you can also say PY version and then dash dash search. And the output of this is something that you can just cut and paste with the mouse and put it in your EXT's extents list. So R stands in the bottom here, and above it, in two columns, are all the dependencies. So that's what it takes to walk that tree. Um, so if you were just building a single R instance with R stand in it, you know this is what would be in there. Um, Another feature I have that I haven't made public yet because the code is so ugly and I'm embarrassed by it, but uh, you know, you'll end up having like the standard R distribution and then your custom one. So after you've typed this and you have this huge list, almost certainly there's a lot of duplication between what's in this and the official easy build distribution is. So you'd like to be able to subtract that out because again, we're humans and I don't want to spend all day like picking through this file and, and looking for those duplicate entries. Um, and the diff is a really weird feature. It's not something you'd use every day unless you're forced to build R uh, over the weekend. And <coughs> I'm really in the automation. It's something I think of a lot. So uh, 2019A was just released. And I'm thinking, like, why don't we have all 1,000 easy build modules updated over the weekend? Like, we should just be able to go out to the internet and update all the version information, not just the entries into um, R and Python, but all of our bioinformatics modules. And it's, it's, it, there's no answer to that. That is, uh, but I think about putting, like, maybe the idea of, like, hints. The easy build file itself tells you it's in GitHub or it's in a private repo or, you know, it tells you a lot about where it might be coming from, SourceForge. And it's not that they're like there's APIs for that, but you could probably, I don't know, it's probably not worth the effort. But uh, just talking about it, I think like in the future, people need to be cognizant of things like that and educating programmers when they're young in school. Like GitHub's a really great thing, but even when we look at GitHub, it's just a morass. I mean, it could just be master.zip. 
it could be v1.4 instead of, you, you know, it could be uh, releases, it could be versioned or no information. And when I find that in the wild, uh, I'm that guy issue, you know, putting an issue in. Please tag your software. Please make a release. Please get that V out of there. Um, so, you know, just going out there and standing in front of you guys, complaining. But, you know, doing something to improve software in general, how it's being released. And we're all using Easy Build because we want it to be reproducible science. This is, this is something I've had in mind for a while, having a backlash update. Of the, yeah. the web and try and figure out what the latest version is. And you're right, getting it perfect is going to be very, very hard. It's a mess. But I think we can probably do it for like 90%. Yeah. Which just GCC or Doom software has a very standard way. You mm -hmm. just look into the directory and sort things the right way and you can figure out the versions. Um, I think for some, even for most of the software on GitHub, it's still okay if they do proper release tagging. Mm -hmm. And if you see a V, you just throw it out there. So we can probably do like 90% good and then very special ones like open foam or no tagging or I don't know what. Then yeah. Okay, you do those manually, but it will still save you a lot of work if you do 90%. I might, I might take a stab at the GitHub stuff and as a, as a first go, see what I can get. Just run it through, just run it over the weekend and see what the results are. Uh, oh yeah, like... Linux from scratch, that's it, it, that's such a great site. It's just like it's not really like uh, releases. You know, it's not like a, a distribution. So all the modules that are out there in, in Linux are there. And it's a, a place I go and I look for stuff a lot to see like what's possible. It may not be in CentOS or Ubuntu, but uh, it's kind of like a, a neutral site for me. And, and then, you know, Nanopore, they're... Uh, they're difficult to deal with. And uh, so I think like a lot of people, we started using Easy Build around 2015. And I would just at the time just thought like, oh, this is a great tool for building software. We'll be able to save our easy configs. We'll be able to reproduce it. We are saving every time I download a file, a source file for some project, I am saving it along with the Easy Build. Uh, it's amazing how many source files disappear over the years or projects get pulled on GitHub. And, uh, you know, again, we want to make science reproducible. So having those source files on site and spending the money on the storage to keep them will help make that reproducible. But, uh, you know, we were just all over the place with, with our easy configs. And we might grab something. It's like, well, we're using this version of the Zlib. So you know, we'd end up making a new easy config just because of like something that's very inconsequential, I would think. You know, like who cares which version of Zlib is in some bioinformatics package? The, the researcher doesn't know. They just want their stuff to work. So the last year, we've really made a big effort, like how can we use, and the 2018B, of course, is a huge release, making sure that all the dependencies are the same. I'm, I'm in that boat. I, I don't want them to change. I want you know consistency across the line for that. So um, we're very much on <coughs> committed to being a you know 2018B, making sure everything's consistent, and for the first time trying to contribute back. And like our R and Python have always been very divergent, and we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to use the standard Python, the standard R that comes down from the community and then I'll make a bundle that has all the extra modules that we want in it. And we'll do the same with Python. So uh, just want to try to encourage, like, you know, more sharing and have more uniformity in the, in the recipes and not have so many of them. And, uh, you know, again, so I'm, uh, personally, we're <laughs> upgrading our clusters operating system. And it, what a task. So uh, I'm the guy who's rebuilding all the software. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm maybe about 80% of the way there. I've, I've got to the end of March to get there. So like the idea of the community, I know it's out there and like issues and stuff like that. But like, you know, boy, you know, where could I post like a, a you know, modules wanted list or something like who, I mean, it doesn't seem like anyone has any spare time, but. <laughs> 
we would, I, I don't know, we'll get to some point, I, I don't know, my boss has mentioned the same thing, like maybe getting funding a position, and uh, it, it would, that money would, would look like it's well spent if it's national money, the National Institute of Health spending that, you know, then prove that, well, we're contributing this back into the community and mm -hmm. it's being shared by a, a large number of people. So I think that's kind of our angle on funding that. Maybe a central place to, to list wanted software is actually a good idea because many people are sitting on easy conflict that are not contributing because of a lack of time. And they could just tell you, look, I have something here. I don't have time to do the proper contribution, but take it and use yeah. it as a starting point. And I'm, I, I'm sure some of the software at least would, would already be there handled by someone in some way. Um, uh, uh, you know, as everyone posts their URLs to their GitHub, you know, I'm trying to type them out. The, I'm going to have to parse through them all at the end of the show. And so <coughs> get my, my list of places to go to Wait, look Maybe modules. we should even have a separate repository on GitHub where you just open an issue like a wanted repository. Hmm. And if people have an easy config file, just copy paste it in the issue and you can take it just up from there. That'd be... That could work. Yeah, that would we could at least try it and see yeah, if it works. Yeah. So just quick and dirty contributions and then someone else can take it from there and that would be a big a big help. And then maybe, you know, if enough people use it, maybe we you know get it polished and check it in, get it yeah. upstream. Yeah. Um so the, the, oh yeah. No I get I was gonna ask which OS of uh, yeah, so we're moving from fourteen oh four, which is rather embarrassing, uh, up to eighteen oh four and from tool chains 2016b to 2018b. So uh, we've put the, there's a little hook you can put in LMOD that writes a message to syslog. Um, and so we're using that hook. Uh, we want to make some, some changes to it. And then we take that syslog information, we put it in Splunk. So for the, our entire cluster it takes hours to run these reports, but we can we can actually get a report on every module load command across the entire cluster. So that's kind of the the basis of how I'm picking what to build uh, for the next release. So we have 138 uh, modules that are in the bio directory of uh, you know that nice little easy config at very 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 at the bottom where it says module class. That is super helpful. So I'm just kind of like looking at layer eight, just like the, what the researchers see, just those bioinformatics modules and all of that other stuff, all of those other lives are just kind of making themselves with dash dash robot. Um, yeah, so 50, 51 million module loads uh, are clusters, not anywhere near the size of some of you uh, that have presented. And 1.3 million of those are, are in uh, bio packages. So that's my, my target for what to, what to rebuild. Um, so th there's a pull request that's still in the works, right, about updating dependencies. But this kind of transition where you're going from 2016B to 2018B, it would automatically pick up all the latest versions and insert them into the things that, sh that you're trying to do, that you're trying to move over. So there's no hand editing of anything like that, right? It'll automatically update uh, stuff that's already available in 2018B, right? Uh, well, I'm not sure I understand. So, so say you have something in 2016B that uses auto tools, mm -hmm. an old version, right? And there's a later version in 2018B. It will automatically update that in and the transition. That, and that's available in Easy Build today? No, no, it's not. It's, it's still, it's still, it's we're still waiting for a review. But right. it's it, yeah. it's working. I mean, okay, that'd be a big help. Um, but you know, some things I've done is I've just you know go to the 2018b repo and every bio, bio module that you have, whether I needed them or not, I just I looped through that uh, last week and I think I built 57 packages with just a script that ran over the weekend. So um, yeah, I just kind of like scoop up whatever I can. And that's the the end of my end of my talk. Just a just a quick update on easy update. Oh, uh, we do have like a a demo. Uh, the other half of easy update is something called easy annotate. So the same code that reads a uh, uh, an easy config. 
you know, I can take that and unwind it and publish it. So uh, this site is a GitHub Markdown pages, and this is attached to our Easy Build repository. So whenever I check in a new module, uh, it's kind of awkward. You have to do it twice. Uh, you know, you create all the documentation, and then GitHub publishes the the Markdown side for you. So uh, things like R modules, we you know we have a lot of R uh, years of it. Uh, 2018b. So here's my current one. So it. Easy Annotate does is it publishes a list of all those modules that are inside the Easy Config. So um, with this site now, a user can just go here and hit the little uh, <coughs> search thing. And if they're looking for a module, you know maybe it's already installed. I, probably about half of the help desk tickets I have now are stuff I already have installed. The people don't know how to find it. So trying to keep everything we have published, all of our bioinformatics stuff published, all of our easy configs published, and in like a user-friendly way, overview using like a little tutorial on how to use modules. So in general, we can just kind of direct users at the site to this page. And then uh, all of these are linked back to their original. Uh, so if you want to know what that module does or what the source is, And that's all easy, you know, all, all the features and easy update of, of crawling the web and finding all of these links. You know, so it's all in the code so I can annotate this and produce Markdown. Uh, and it just, you know, this whole site, again, it's all, all driven. And then, of course, since we have a module list of just bio, uh, you know, I can publish that. So these are all the the modules we have in our bio. Um, and mostly, again, like having it on a web page makes it searchable so people at the site can just go here and look before they, they open up an issue with us. So, questions? First of all, great talk, I and mean, it's really great that you're tackling one of the problems which, um, we, which uh, many of us fight. Um, out of curiosity, and since you um, uh, are kind of uh, related to the uh, bioconductor community, uh, quark position, local locality, whatever, um, R essentially is uh, sticking to a semantic versioning scheme, but not officially. And I uh, recall the day where uh, the um, Bioconda community asked the R developers to actually announce that they uh, stick to a semantic versioning and they never got a reply. They never get a con confirmation that R uh, will adapt semantic versioning, even though if you look up the details of every re release, it's essentially semantic versioning. And, and all the dependencies and the minor patches are uh, uh, could be dependable. Yeah. And do you have any word from the R developers on that uh, issue? No, we're, we're kind of out of touch right now. But I, I know people who know people, so I, I, could, I, could get, I could get to them. But yeah, it's, it's pretty frustrating, right? I mean, you know, some of the R modules obviously don't, don't move at the same rate as the, you know, some of these things have been sitting around for a few years. But, but it wouldn't be a problem if the update wouldn't be enforced because it, it's, it's a actually um, a compatible in most of the cases. Uh, it could be flagged otherwise, but yeah. Yeah, uh, and I've, you know, I've, I've had to fudge things like, you know, it's, things are broke. I mean, I, I would just, you know, just drop down a version and, and try again. Um, y yeah, w it, it should be better. Thank you. Oh, thank you.